Good afternoon. On behalf of the Center for Community Progress, I'd like to welcome you to the April edition of our Cornerstone webinars. My name is Justin Goddard, and I serve as a program officer for National Leadership and Education here at Community Progress. Cornerstone is our monthly webinar series that equips participants with the building blocks to understand and solve tough challenges related to property vacancy, abandonment, and deterioration. For today's Cornerstone, we are joined by Matt Kreis, Assistant General Counsel for National Initiatives at the Center for Community Progress. Matt is a member of the National Technical Assistance Team at Community Progress, where he has worked with dozens of cities and communities across the country to assess, reform, develop, and implement systems and policies to more equitably, efficiently, and effectively address vacant, abandoned, and deteriorated properties. Prior to joining the Center for Community Progress, Matt spent more than nine years as an attorney at the City of Chicago's Department of Law, where he focused on identifying, developing, and implementing effective enforcement tools to address problem properties. Before I turn the presentation over to Matt, I want to mention that we will allow time at the end of the presentation to answer questions. If you have a question during the presentation, Please type it into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your browser and send it to both the webinar host and all presenters. Finally, if you experience any technical difficulties, please use the chat box to message the Community Progress host or send an email to Justin Goddard at jgoddard at communityprogress.net. And with that, I turn it over to Matt. Justin, thank you so much. Appreciate everything. Um, let's start here. First and foremost, I want to go ahead and introduce Community Progress for those of you who may not be totally aware of who we are. We are the only national nonprofit solely focused on building a future in which entrenched systemic vacancy and abandonment no longer exist. We do this through a whole different kind, number of programming policies. We do policy development, technical assistance, leadership development, education, and research. We have provided technical assistance in more than 250 communities in 30 states. Uh, we've reached thousands of professionals. And the one final thing I want to point everybody to is our upcoming Reclaiming Vacant Properties Conference in Milwaukee on May 15th through 17th. Please, please consider coming and joining nearly a 1,000 uh, other professionals in this area who are looking at unique and innovative ways to address the problems that these properties present in communities all over the country. So I hope to see all of you there. On our webinar today, we are going to discuss the building blocks of code enforcement. Uh, and we're going to focus a lot on how ordinances can be those building blocks of an equitable, efficient, and effective code enforcement program. Uh, in many cases, local practitioners like you, um, and although I am a lawyer, uh, this webinar is definitely geared towards folks from all different backgrounds. Uh, many of you, no matter whether or not you're a lawyer, a city official, a code enforcement official, you are uniquely positioned to understand, critique, and identify the changes needed to ensure the local ordinances enable you and your teams to carry out successful code enforcement programs. So we will discuss some overarching considerations for ordinance construction, but primarily I'd like to focus on what the key elements of an equitable, efficient, and effective code enforcement program are, and how and if those elements might be codified in a local ordinance. So the agenda. First and foremost, we need to understand what is the goal of code enforcement. Um, and that'll be a quick slide, but uh, definitely it's important to establish that at the outset. Next, what authority do we have to get to that goal? What authority do we have to enforce? And we'll start with state law. We'll take a quick look there, there. And then we'll look to what our local laws and ordinances allow. Once we understand the reaches of that authority, uh, we'll move into discussing what makes an equitable, efficient, and effective enforcement program. Um, and how can that enforcement program be better coordinated as part of a systemic and comprehensive approach to property in general. We'll discuss a few components or examples of an equitable, efficient, and effective program. And then finally, we'll sum up with a few key takeaways, and we will have some time for questions. Note there are a lot of participants on this uh, call, 
we will certainly try to get to as many questions as we can, but probably won't get to everybody. So thank you so much for your patience. So before we really dive into everything, I think it's always important to set the stage with a definition. What are we talking about here? When I use the term housing and building code enforcement, I'm talking about a system, not just of law, but a system of law, policy, and programs that require property owners to maintain their property in accordance with certain local standards. It's also the system by which the local government or the city uh, ensures that those standards are met. And throughout this presentation, I'll use the term city or local government, um, but really to refer to any sort of uh, local government that can enforce or develop their own ordinances for housing and building code enforcement. So when we talk about these, we talk about a range of violations. Uh, many communities break them down into building standards, health code standards, fire prevention standards, property maintenance standards. Um, so that means high weeds, open and vacant property, lead paint violations, serious structural deficiencies, uh, environmental violations, zoning violations on both the interior and the exterior of properties. Um, housing and building code enforcement, also we need to understand who enforces these standards. Is it the city, the county, the state? police, fire, all of these different agencies. So when we talk about this, we're talking about a whole range of people coming together. And when we talk about things like high weeds and other sort of property uh, exterior violations, things like that, it's important to recognize that sometimes those, what may seem like more minor violations can lead to the bigger, more challenging issues. Uh, for example, in the city of Chicago, at one point we had a property owner who had every year, weeds that uh, completely obscured the entire property uh, all the time, cited the property owner year after year. Uh, he fought those challenges in court over and over. We assessed lots and lots of fines. And eventually after I left, my boss called and said, hey, guess what? We finally got an order in there. We got rid of those weeds, and guess what we found? We found that the weeds were obscuring a rear entrance, illegally converted apartment where a couple of elderly folks were living uh, in the basement, uh, and there was a pool of water on the floor about a quarter inch thick, uh, and it led to a whole host of other problems. That's, that example is merely to illustrate that sometimes even when we talk about what we might think are the more minor violations, they can be asymptomatic of the larger stuff. All right, so let's move into the goal of code enforcement. The number one goal for almost every code enforcement officer is always going to be voluntary compliance. We want to go from the picture on the left to the picture on the right. And we want to do that without expending public time and dollars other than notice. We want the owner to understand the problem, have a clear idea of what is needed to correct the problem, and then to address it themselves. Well, and here's the problem for everybody else. What happens when we can't get what we want there? One way to look at it is an a, a approach that community progress often advocates for, which is called fix it up, pay it up, give it up. And this is an approach that often works best for vacant properties. We also have to recognize the difference between vacant properties and occupied properties, and recognize that when we're talking about those two things, we're talking about two different sorts of strategies and approaches. When we talk about fix it up for vacant properties, we're talking about we want the owner to comply. And if the owner doesn't comply, Maybe the local government has to step in and do it for them. If the local government does have to step in and do it for them or has to assess a fine, the owner needs to pay back the public costs for securing that property or making it so that it's safe and doesn't impose a danger to the neighbors in the neighborhood. Finally, if the owner doesn't fix it up, the owner doesn't pay up the public costs, then we look to transfer the property to a responsible owner and possibly give it up. So where do we get the authority to enforce? In particular, the ability to enforce where we do not uh, achieve that voluntary compliance. First thing we have to do is we start with state law. The first thing we must understand is we understand what the state constitution says about the authority to enforce. Uh, a key provision here to note is the extent to which the local government has the authority to exercise its powers of governance to, for example, pass or adopt local housing and building codes. This authority is generally called home rule. Some states, like Illinois, 
um, Connecticut, they grant local governments stronger home rule authority to pass or adopt housing and building codes in a way that they see fit. If home rule exists, it may depend on the size of the county, the city, or the county seeking to exercise such powers. We contrast that with other states uh, that might be Dillon's rural states. Um, in some states, like Mississippi or Virginia, uh, municipalities only have the authority to govern or pass laws where the state has expressly said it can do so. So we've got to understand that. We also have to understand, has the state adopted statewide housing and building code standards? If so, does it require local governments to adhere to or adopt the same standards? Or does the state allow local governments to adopt the standards by choice or adopt their own? A lot of states and cities, as most of you know, have adopted uh, building standards from the International Code Council, like the Building Code or the Fire Prevention Code. It's also key to know in a state that has adopted those ICC codes whether it has also adopted a property maintenance code or if it allows the local government to adopt its own. The property maintenance code um, will allow for more uh, violations on the interior properties and, and standards there. So, um, State law is also going to dictate the type of violations or the type of forum in which such cases might be heard. For example, uh, are code violations going to be civil violations? Are they criminal? Um, must they be heard in state or county court? Can they be heard in an administrative court? Uh, is there a hearing authority within the enforcing local government department? All of that is going to come from state law. Do those violations require a hearing to be set, or do they require only those violations that an owner wants to challenge uh, a hearing to be set? Um, again, how does state law dictate how violations are brought to a hearing? The method of enforcement. Is it a summons, a citation, or to abate? And finally, we have to talk about how are costs, penalties, or fines recovered? Um, and then what is the priority? What is the, the tools that a community has to uh, get to those? So if state law does allow enforcement by placing a lien on the property, what is the priority of that lien as it relates to unpaid taxes or a mortgage? Uh, is there a lack of clarity in state law? And might that lack of clarity give certain home rule communities an opportunity to make that decision for themselves? So those are some of the considerations for state law that practitioners will need to take a look at and understand. So once we understand that authority in state law, we get to take a look at what we can do with local ordinances or codes. Ordinances should reflect and take advantage of the full range of authority granted by state law, and they must be crafted to be responsive to local needs. They also must be clear. A property owner should be able to read ordinances and understand what is required of them. One of the ways we can do that and ensure clarity is to define terms, terms that many code enforcement officials are familiar with, uh, a property owner may be less familiar with. Defining the term like dilapidated or hazardous or refuse is going to go a long way towards ensuring that we have that clarity for other folks. Ordinances have to be reflexi flexible and responsive to different types of property owners and neighbors. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. But we need to recognize that multifamily buildings of a certain size are vastly distant, different from single family homes, and that the owners of those properties are often completely different. We also have to be cognizant of those vulnerable occupants of properties, which are often low income homeowners and tenants. If the goal is to get compliance, and that's our number one goal, does Punishing people through excessive fines or criminal penalties really achieve the goal of particularly those people who lack the resources to comply. Uh, finally, change. Communities constantly change. An ordinance relating to building or property condition that's been on the book for 50 or 60 years may not be appropriate for today's properties in your town. And this is something that I think is a very important aspect of understanding local codes is constant review and recommending, recommending updates to local ordinance, it's not just a role for municipal lawyers. Residents affected by the ordinances, code inspectors, police officers called to these properties that are in violation, uh, any other municipal staff that impact or use these local ordinances on a day-to-day -day basis should be on the lookout for changes that need to be made and should have a voice in the process. Ordinances also need to clearly articulate 
how the recovery of costs or penalties can be pursued. This is an important part of understanding that what happens next, that enforcement doesn't just end after a violation has been issued or a fine has been implemented. Uh, if the problem has been fixed, great, but if it hasn't, we still have some work to do. And ordinances should be clear as to what that next to do is. So first, they must clearly define the menu of options available to enforce non-payment, right? They need to clearly understand, is it a civil judgment? Is it a criminal judgment? What is the amount? Are penalties assessed on a sliding scale? For example, uh, is the first violation a lower amount and the third time much higher? Um, if the city has to step in and do work, is that treated differently? Um, if it becomes a lien on the property, uh, what priority is that lien? Um, in some jurisdictions, the city may have the authority to revoke or deny business licenses or other permits if there are open code violations in the name of that owner. Not only is it important to know all these things, but it's also important to understand and make sure that we understand the types of owners and properties so that it's effectively and equitably carried out. Note, particularly from our standpoint, vacant and abandoned property may and often should require a different and accelerated approach to get that property back to productive use and to stop it from being a negative influence on neighbors and neighborhoods. So we often get a question, so what does that sort of ideal enforcement look like? Um, and we'll get to this a little bit later, but one thing I wanna point out now is one way to do it is to uh, think about in-rem enforcement. And this is particularly for vacant and abandoned properties. There's a new law in the books, which I'll talk about in just a little while in the Code of Alabama, which prioritizes judicial in-rem enforcement. So it kind of takes vacant and abandoned properties um, and sort of puts them through a one-step process that gets them out the other side into productive use with clean, insurable, and marketable title. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So I have used the phrase equitable, efficient, and effective probably 15 times already. So what am I talking about when I say that? So over the next few slides, we'll discuss all of that. We'll also discuss where and how that type of enforcement fits into a broader, more comprehensive approach to property in general. But first, equity. So fairness, general principles of fairness, require us to consider how one law that works in one neighborhood and real estate market may not be appropriate for a different neighborhood or a type of owner. It's important that code enforcement officials understand property values, real estate markets, the cost of repairs, all of those things. We generally want to preserve ownership for those property owners, both homeowners and landlords, that are responsible. So we also wanna make sure the resources are in place for those type of owners to be able to maintain that property. That could take the form of forgivable rehab loans or connecting qualified owners to philanthropic organizations. But in particular, we wanna ensure that resources are available for vulnerable or potentially vulnerable property owners. If the goal is compliance, it makes little sense to repeatedly fine an otherwise responsible property owner for a problem with the roof when the owner doesn't even have the resources to fix the roof. Uh, such a strategy may make it increasingly likely that the property will further deteriorate or become abandoned or incentivize that abandonment. Equity in the law also requires uh, that the voices of those most impacted have to be incorporated in the creation of the policies and the ordinances designed to address these conditions. And then one other point about equity, which we'll talk about in the next slides, we have to recognize the historical segregation of housing and resources that still guides development and the allocation of resources today. And what I mean by that is this map, which shows the practice of redlining in the 1930s and the 1940s by the Home Ownership Loan Corporation. So redlining is generally that term we use to describe the discriminatory practice of fencing off areas where banks would avoid investments based on community demographics, which included things like income level and race. Uh, this map shows that the redlined areas, which the Home Ownership Loan Corporation defined as hazardous in Kansas City in the 30s and 40s, and I show this because it's still relevant today. And this slide shows that the heat map of where dangerous buildings in Kansas City are located today. And you'll note there's an overlap between some of those areas that were redlined and some of those areas in this map where there are still dangerous buildings. 
Equity requires us to recognize the impact of these entrenched policies and other laws in our history in order to ensure that we work to correct those and move, to, move past the mistakes that we've made in the past. So, equitable, or excuse me, efficient code enforcement. When we talk about efficient code enforcement, we are talking about voluntary compliance in the shortest amount of time possible. We want to get notice into the hands of an owner and we want it to be fixed as soon as we can get it there. We generally find that it's more efficient to impose liability on the property as opposed to the owner. And of course, there may be situations um, and systems where that uh, you have responsive owners where that might be a little bit different, but liability on the property is important for two reasons. One, notice. Where we have to impose liability on the owner, we need to get service on the owner. And many of these really problem properties, or real problem properties, excuse me, are, the owners are difficult and hard to find. If we have liability that's imposed on the property, notice takes on a different form. If the goal is compliance or productive use, and not punishment, in REM makes more sense. Uh, that complies with our fix it up, pay it up, give it up. These ways of approaching enforcement are generally more efficient. When we talk about effective code enforcement, we're talking about enforcement strategies that are tailored based on the likelihood of compliance. For example, where we know that compliance is likely, simple notice should do the trick. Where we know that compliance is unlikely, it may be that we need to contemplate a potential transfer of that property. And in those cases, making sure that we provide full due process notice and we have a system where there's a possible judicial sale to a new responsible owner with insurable and marketable title at the end. This is a concept we'll also explore a little bit when we talk about examples uh, moving forward. So, code enforcement as part of a systemic approach. When we talk about local ordinances that provide the building blocks and the authority for local officials to create a program that is equitable, efficient, and effective, we also mean as a whole part of that that this program needs to fit into a larger approach to property in general. We need to tweak the systems that address these issues so that they're coordinated and so that they work together. We need robust data and IT collection practices so that we can inform where we're going to enforce. We talked about where compliance is likely. If we have data that shows the types of neighborhoods or owners where compliance is likely, we can tailor our enforcement to simple notice. Where we have data that shows that compliance is unlikely, we can implement code enforcement strategies that are designed to contemplate a potential outcome with a potential transfer. Code enforcement is bolstered by close connections to the delinquent tax enforcement system, where code enforcement liens, if they're unpaid, can be put on the property tax bill. So they are elevated to that same level where if we have to focus on a transfer of the property, we can use the delinquent tax enforcement system to do so. And then finally, if we are going to push properties through to a new, more productive owner, we have to have appropriate land reuse strategies and tools to ensure that the new use or the new user is going to be something that fits within the community's needs and priorities. Uh, land banking is one such tool that helps to support land reuse strategies. So we talk about this thinking about the full life cycle of the property. We can't do it in a vacuum. Partnerships have to be built at all levels and sustained to ensure that each of the tools and systems available to the community or the city or the local government are wielded in the best way. This kind of approach requires us to use those tools and systems first to prevent future deterioration, like providing resident education, providing resources for vulnerable homeowners, using code enforcement tools like rental registration and licensing programs, um, property tax enforcement tools, and rental inspection and lead paint programs uh, to encourage and incentivize compliance. If those preventative tools and systems cannot compel or support compliance, after all these rec equitable remedies are exhausted, we should be looking at how the tools and systems can be used to mitigate the harm done by that property on neighbors or the neighborhood and get it into the hands of a new, more responsible owner, uh, whether or not that's through nuisance abatement or the transfer of the property. 
And finally, this addressing the full life cycle has to contemplate the reuse of the property like we just spoke about, so that it's directed to an owner that will put the property back to use in line with the needs and priorities of the neighbors and communities. One of those key partnerships I wanna highlight, it is essential that the city, the county, developers, realtors are at the table, but it is also essential that residents are at the table, that the folks impacted by these are there and their voices are heard. So components of an equitable, efficient, and effective enforcement program. Here's the thing. It has been our experience that there is no one code enforcement program in the country that meets all of these elements. But there are so many that are doing so many things very, very well. So what this next section is, is it's going to be some of the top examples or components of uh, equitable, and efficient and effective enforcement that we've seen across the country. Note that in these slides, uh, we do not have direct links to these resources yet. We will follow up after the webinar with links to some of these resources uh, in the hopes that some folks can uh, utilize them and take advantage of some of the great work that our partners across the country have already done. So, this is, some, Moving into some of these components, and I apologize for my lack of technical uh, <laughs> efficiency here. So components of 3E enforcement, which is what I call it. Number one, educate property owners. I'll point you to Fort Myers, Florida, where they uh, have developed the Code Man Hero website. It's a little cheesy. Um, but what I was unable to get the cartoon picture of the actual hero they've developed, what they've done on here is to make a resource for property owners that tells property owners exactly how to comply with the code, provides links to resources, uh, offers code enforcement officials to come out and help property owners comply. I mean, it does, throw through, does throw, so through kind of a fun storytelling way of doing so. So it's, it's kind of an interesting way of doing it. Uh, New Orleans has an excellent handbook on their website. And this book explains in very easy to understand terms and in bullet points, which I love. Um, it also goes on to add sufficient detail, but it tells what is required of property owners to maintain their homes, provides a clear outline of what might happen if there is no compliance. It links to resources to help with repairs and the city contacts to help uh, support and answer questions. An ordinance isn't necessary uh, to provide a program or to create a program to educate property owners, uh, but this is something that folks can do without that. Encourage resident input. I've referenced that a few times throughout. Uh, again, keeping with New Orleans for a moment, they have the Blightstat program. Uh, Blightstat requires these monthly public meetings. It tracks the New Orleans efforts to reduce blight in certain neighborhoods across the, uh, across the, uh, the city. Residents get updates for their neighborhoods from the city. They give input on issues considering them. Again, this is a tool that is extremely helpful to inform the program where an ordinance may or may not be necessary. However, I will point out the absolute need for mayoral or executive leadership uh, and their need to prioritize these kinds of things uh, as important and integral parts of a program. Uh, resources for low-income homeowners. I reference here uh, an article, an Oakland article here, which highlights the danger of code enforcement programs that are driven to be what they call self-sustaining entirely through fees or penalties. Uh, there's a need, they note, to connect low-income or elderly homeowners and other property resources uh, with other city resources uh, to help with repairs or connect them to private or philanthropic resources. Uh, some of these resources can include five-year forgivable loans to fund repairs, simple grant programs. It's also important to understand that it's not just always homeowners. Uh, in many cases, people living in substandard properties are tenants. These are rental properties um, that may also need access to resources. So like I said earlier, ordinances don't necessarily need to reflect education or encourage resident output. That is something a successful code, and program should, code enforcement program should have ingrained, at least in their policies and procedures. Ordinances can, however, direct qualified property owners to appropriate resources. Um, although it isn't always used as well, in Dallas, a local ordinance requires certain low-income property owners 
who receive a notice of a code violation to apply to what was called the Dallas Tomorrow Fund, which is a public-private investment fund, to take advantage of potential rehab dollars if they were available. Uh, we also talk about targeted, outcome-driven enforcement as part of this important system. Um, I referenced the Building American Cities Toolkit available on the community website, but what's important to understand here is that markets, housing markets drive the decision to make repairs. Uh, and creating local ordinances and enforcement of those ordinances, we have to be aware that in most cases, most cases, the decision to repair is an economic decision. Right? We want healthy housing for all, but that economic decision is something we also have to understanding. After understand, we should recognize the code should allow for flexible enforcement. We need local discretion, but the inspector should also understand that in markets where property values are low and where the cost of repairs plus the amount already invested in a property may well exceed the market value of the property, then compliance might not always be likely. In those areas and after equitable options for support have been made accessible, a likely outcome may be the eventual demolition or transfer of that property. We contrast that with high value markets where simple notice is likely to be effective given that the potential loss of valuable property um, should be enough to compel action. So inspectors need to understand these economic demands, the cost of repairs, and be willing to work with owners towards compliance. And we should target our enforcement efforts based on what we know about those markets and what we hope to accomplish. Proactive rental inspection and licensing. This is a topic that comes up quite a bit across the country. There are a range of options for how we might address the quality of rental housing in a community. Um, rental regulation can range from simple registration programs, uh, which can be helpful to identify points of contact for properties where a problem might exist, to more proactive programs that involve inspections and licensing components. Many of these types of programs recognize that Property rentals uh, are a key small business operating in their jurisdictions, and they're not all that different from other businesses. So these programs may tie licensing for that business model to inspections to ensure the health and safety of tenants. Um, they may involve offering landlords incentives to comply, like less frequent inspections or reduced fees. Ordinances are key here, um, although perhaps not as much as policies and procedures. Uh, but the need to be very clear, both ordinances and policies and procedures, how the program will work, the parameters of the program, and what is required of property owners. Ordinances should also be conscious and build in protections for those vulnerable tenants to ensure equitable enforcement. Um, they've got to be cognizant of state law requirements and mindful of constitutional rights when forming this program. So some of the key programs we've found, and I'll highlight uh, very quickly, Rochester, New York, which is noteworthy in part because uh, local participation in the program is extremely high, and that's based on the great work folks there have done, building trust with not only different agencies of the county and the city, but also with landlords and tenants in general. Um, but it does a really great integration of its program with uh, other city and county health and safety programs like its Lead Safe program. Uh, we noted here the city of Minneapolis uh, because of its performance-based program, which, as they note, is designed to help maintain property values and assure the preservation of housing stock. That program essentially offers big discounts to landlords for units that have no or very minor violations on inspection and allows for decreased inspection over time. So proactive rental inspection and licensing. Another component that we've found that works very well is to generally eliminate criminal enforcement. Now, some jurisdictions have found a way to utilize such enforcement in an equitable way, uh, but what we have generally found is that it can be very ineffective, and for two, two particular reasons. Uh, I already touched on notice. Um, criminal enforcement generally requires personal service or the type of service on a person to bring them into court to get jurisdiction. This can be particularly difficult for those very trouble, troublesome properties and out-of-state owners, absentee owners, corporate owners. Uh, many of you know these problems, um, and criminal enforcement can make that difficult. It's generally also not results-oriented. Uh, again, uh, certain 
well-minded attorneys or programs can can find a way to really tie compliance to it, but it's also it's more about punishment and it's less about what is going on with the property itself. Um, criminal housing and building code enforcement tends to impose harsh penalties, uh, also on most vulnerable property owners who simply just do not have the means to fix up the property. Um, and like I said, with the notice issue, it doesn't really impact those worst the worst actors that include those out-of-state and corporate slum property owners. So what would we say works instead? Uh, we focus on in-rem liability. And where that, what that means is against the property. So we're focused here on the property, uh, where we go away from personal enforcement and we look to have a lien on the property that can force the eventual transfer of the property. If the property owner is not concerned about losing the property, then chances are pretty good that the owner is not concerned with keeping the property up to code. I referenced earlier a new Alabama state law, which was passed uh, under House Bill 430. Um, it's now codified, and the city of uh, Mobile, to which this law applies, has now passed an ordinance. And again, what this ordinance does is it allows housing and building code violations to be placed as a lien against the property, and once they reach a certain amount, the city can foreclose on them in a judicial proceeding. It takes one judicial proceeding, full constitutional due process notice is given, and at the end of that process, the purchaser of the property, there's a sale of the property, and the purchaser gets clear and marketable and insurable title, which is absolutely key, so there are no extra steps uh, for doing so. So that is in rem liability. Um, and the threat of doing so can also help to compel compliance in many cases. Uh, to do this, we actually need to also address the status of the priority of code liens. Uh, we talked about this earlier as well. We need to make sure that we have the authority to move forward and enforce those types of liens to be able to do what we want to be able to do. Again, I just referenced this with the Alabama state law, but marketable and insurable title is key. If we are going to focus on a transfer of the property, and again, we are not talking about displacing homeowners or displacing people in general. We are talking primarily about these most troublesome vacant and abandoned properties. If we are going to push the transfer of these properties, we need to ensure that that transfer, uh, the process for that transfer, meets constitutional due process standards. What does that mean? It means we need to provide notice that's reasonably calculated to apprise the owner and all interested parties of the pending action and to give them an opportunity to be heard. Uh, that is a case that most of us will refer to as Mennonite Board of Missions versus Adams, uh, where the court held that if a proceeding will adversely affect any party's interests and if the party's name and address are reasonably ascertainable, then notice by mail or any other means equally certain to actually notify is a minimum constitutional precondition. So it allows us to serve by mail, but we have to serve everybody who is involved and we have to give them actual notice. So that at the end of the day, we have property that is ready to go and is marketable, can be insured, and thus can be used for all kinds of different properties or purposes, excuse me. So I have covered a lot of ground here today. Uh, we've talked an awful lot about equitable, efficient, and effective enforcement, which if you continue to work with community progress, you will also continue to hear. <laughs> Some of the key takeaways I really want to stress. You need to clarify that the goals and strategies of your housing and building code enforcement program with a focus on generating voluntary compliance um, you need to understand to research and understand state law authority for and limitations on housing and building code enforcement. You need to craft ordinances that are clear, flexible, and responsive that take full advantage of state law authority. And we need to ensure ordinances and strategies are part of a systemic and comprehensive approach to code enforcement that is also equitable, efficient, and effective. With that, I'd like to move into questions. Um, I'm going to take just a few moments to go ahead and uh, collect and take all these questions, and I'm going to put you on mute, and I will get back to you in just about two or three minutes. 
All right, we are back. Um, I have a lot of questions here, folks. I really hope to address a number of them. Uh, I've got about seven to 10 minutes here uh, in order to do so. Uh, one of the first questions I want to address is, would you talk about the difference for using code, of force, code enforcement on occupied and rental properties uh, versus on vacant properties? Um, I would say first, um, as far as vacant properties, a lot of what I just spoke about dealt with vacant properties. And then again, it's that in-rem enforcement. It's that ability to say if that vacant property is not being used in that same place, in the, in the proper way, or if it's causing harm to the community, we should have the tools to push that property through the system to a new and more responsible owner. We wanna make sure we do that efficiently so that at the end of the day, we have a property that can be reactivated. Um, if there are a whole bunch of title issues attached to that property, if there's a whole bunch of liens that weren't cleared by that process, that's not an efficient way of pushing a vacant property through. So that's vacant property. For occupied property, I think the shift focuses um, not just from trying to push that property through, but more so, even more so, to compliance. We want to make sure that we have a safe, habitable, and healthy place to do so. And so we need to find what leverage is there to do so. Education, of course, is key. Um, providing resources, certain landlords own these properties, but uh, although they mean well, may need some ability or some help to be able to fix them up to standards, particularly given market conditions. But we wanna look at the tools to leverage that, to compel that compliance in those cases. Um, and in those cases, we wanna look at how can a community craft an ordinance that, for example, looks at the rental income from that property and how can it sort of use that or prevent that income and compel that lever use that as leverage to compel compliance. So there are two different strategies, owner-occupied where we're, or, or excuse me, Occupied rental was your question. We really want to focus on compliance and keeping people in the properties. Displacement is messy and often unfair, and we don't always do it that well. Um, so that's our first focus. Um, let's see here. One question, uh, get a lot of pushback from residents and property owners that oppose any kind of increased code enforcement and would, be very, and would likely be very against a system where a code lien can be used to foreclose. What is your response? Uh, I would say twofold. First, uh, the increased code enforcement I would reference above is, it's first and foremost a way to protect the rights of neighboring property owners who also have a need not to see their property value and enjoyment diminished. Second, um, I would say that particularly related to the forced transfer of a property, I'd say the goal of the program is to increase property values. Uh, getting the property back to productive use has a benefit for neighbors and the community uh, in increasing value, improving the local market, uh, and improving uh, local morale as well, which I think is, is very key. Uh, pardon my cold just a little bit here. Uh, I do have a question here. What about the, with governments moving everything to the internet for publication, what measures can be put in place so that those homeowners, landlords, and renters, as well as organizations, find out about the program, which are not well known. I actually think that the code enforcement officials themselves are the key here. Uh, and again, I will point to uh, our friends in Rochester, New York. A key part of training your code enforcement officer should be training them on how to interact with property owners, uh, tenants, and all those folks so that they can be the face and, and reference for other folks. Uh, they should be out in the neighborhood. Folks should be aware of who they are. They should be seen as a resource, right? These are people who understand what needs to be done, and they can help people understand that. So I would say that your first way to get that message out there uh, is to make sure that your code enforcement officers understand how to interact with folks uh, to let them know and to help them and push them towards what's going on with the internet and all those kinds of things. Um, targeted code enforcement uh, is mentioned. Doesn't that mean that certain neighborhoods get ignored? Uh, I wouldn't use the word ignored. I think the idea behind targeted enforcement uh, based on data is to direct what's often, what are often limited resources to areas where they will have the most impact at that point in time, and I stress that. So code enforcement should never ignore 
I'm using air quotes here, uh, other neighborhoods, but they should continue to, continue to monitor properties for public safety and health issues. Uh, the argument has to be made that where code enforcement can have the greatest positive impact is where it should start, but that over the long term, that impact will carry over to other neighborhoods. Um, I have another question here that neighborhoods with a high concentration of problem properties owned by absentee owners are the same ones where property owners are vulnerable. How can code enforcement authorities decide what type of response uh, to code violations to pursue? Um, I would certainly say that that is a, a big problem, and I'm assuming that we're talking about here uh, vulnerable resources. So I would say that there needs to be some sort of understanding of the market there, and not just the housing market and the value of these properties, there also needs to be uh, an understanding of what it costs to repair. Like I referenced earlier, if the cost of repairs plus whatever the home, uh, the property owner already has invested in the property is not, is going to exceed the value of that property, you're going to have some problems um, in compelling compliance. So we need to figure out what sort of tools and resources there are for those property owners to ensure that the people living in the properties don't get displaced. Um, again, there aren't a ton of great resources that I am personally aware of out there, but uh, certainly, uh, Local philanthropies, I would say local financial institutions and some cities across the country have, have addressed this and are looking to address this in the future. Um, one more question, should liens for mowing lawns or cutting weeds or liens for other types of things like exterior properties really be used to force a transfer? Um, I appreciate this question. Uh, I'd say that there's a few ways to look at that. So if the local government is doing work on the property, then those are taxpayer dollars or services to be spent on your property. They're not all that different from, let's say, water being delivered to the property or an assessment for sewer improvements. improvements. So why shouldn't it enjoy a similar status? Um, and maybe it isn't, and often it isn't, appropriate to force a transfer on all those properties with those types of liens, but a decision has to be made strategically whether it makes sense to move that property through the process and what the end use of that property might be. So other questions would certainly need to be considered. Is it occupied? Um, is the fact that it, the property is in the state it is uh, an issue of resources? Maybe it makes sense for local officials to have discretion to waive fines and fees against properties. Uh, so that that result doesn't happen. Uh, in some states, that might be a problem if state law or the Constitution has a provision that limits the ability of a city to waive debt, but uh, I think in most places, that would likely be okay. Uh, folks, I just wanna say thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, talk to you today about code enforcement. I encourage you all to attend the Reclaiming Vacant Properties Conference in Milwaukee. Uh, I am always available. My email is on this slide right here. I certainly hope that you reach out to me with any sort of questions, or if you want to have a discussion about some of the things we talked about today, I look forward to hearing from you. Once again, thank you so much for attending the webinar today, and hope to talk to you soon. All right. Uh, thanks, Matt, and thank you to everybody who joined us this afternoon. We'll be taking a brief hiatus for the month of uh, May and hope that you will join us on June 28th for the next Cornerstone webinar. Please visit our website for more information on this and other upcoming webinars and have a great afternoon.